Okay, we're going to start our second talk in the distributions room. This room. Um, I cannot assume anymore that all the persons are obviously the users. I will do also a short project introduction so people that don't know Yast know a little bit what does it mean. So, <clears throat> to start, this is our new logo. This is how you will find Yast in OpenSUSE uh, since the 11.2 release. Um, and some quick facts. Uh, Yast is right now the most complete configuration tool available in any distribution. It's consistent, it runs uh, in three different uh, UI modes. It's also a developing environment. You can write your own uh, modules and plugins for it. Um, and it's a really small core, actually. It's less than three megabytes. And with this, you can write modules that uh, in, in basically any language, Perl, Ruby, Python, and our own language called YCP. So this is how Yast looks in the Qt mode. This is the network settings of OpenSUSE. Uh, with the same code, you can run it on the GTK. You get a known look. And with the same code, you can also get a Encurses UI, which means you can administer your server over SSH, for example. I have even seen a picture of uh, it works in the cell phones using these SSH clients. Um, the modules we provide with Yas are quite broad in, uh, in what they can do. You can find modules almost for everything. Uh, some modules are specific, for example, to Celeste, uh, like ISCASI, storage, fiber channel. But most in the open source, you will find most of the others, like user management. You can configure almost any kind of server or client, MTP, web servers. And the value of YAST is not about touching the files or knowing the, the syntax of the configuration files, but it's actually integration. Like if you try to configure an Apache web server, and you don't have, you don't know, you don't need to know which packages you need to have installed because YAST will ask you to install Apache if you don't have it installed. And after you have it uh, configured, it will actually open the AT port in the firewall. So all the integration between the modules is actually what the value of YAST is. In the last releases, we have uh, invested a lot on making it uh, nice looking, thanks uh, to the QT features of theming. We also simplified a lot the installation workflow to make the installation uh, simpler, not asking so many questions like before. Mm. In some cases, just asking various, various questions in the same screen. Uh, we redid the, the UI of popular modules, like for example, storage which now is, uh, looks much more professional, <coughs> supporting cryptography, RAID, uh, LVM. Uh, it, it did also support them before, but it was not, the UI was not thought for that. We also have, uh, it's not really part of the YAS project, but it was born there, the SIP project, which uh, is now a package manager for RPM systems. Uh, it provides a really, really fast uh, solver, um, Compared to YAM and uh, Smart, for example, we consume much less memory. And Zipper is now a really full feature, uh, command line tool. So we, we bring the, the apt-get experience of Debian to the RPM systems. Uh, by the way, the SAT Solver project uh, is also independent of the SIP project. So it's a small library, provides a full uh, solver and a hash mechanism to store really big amount of data uh, coming from packages. If you ever want to do yet another package manager, you could build it also on top of the SAT solver. It's completely RPM independent too. What does SAT stand for? Uh, sorry, okay, uh, that's a... Um, I'm trying to pronounce it in English. Satisfability... Um, um, I forgot the meaning. But it's, bool it's Boolean equation. So you have, a, okay. you have a, an equation that has uh, only Boolean variables. And you need to find the solution. Actually, SAT is satisfability, as far as I know. Okay. <clears throat> so, to quickly tell you what, what it has come from, what we do is we take the dependencies of all the packages, and we turn that into a Boolean problem. Uh -huh. So, a requirement uh, can be expressed as a combination of logic variables. And, of course, nobody guarantees that there is a solution, 
but the problem of SAP is really well known. So there are a lot of popular parsers, uh, popular solvers. Or solver is based on MiniSAT, which is also really popular. And the nice thing is that you can solve really complex uh, upgrades, uh, installations, uh, and you get really nice results. And the code of the core of the solver is really simple because it's just code to solve the equation. It's not code if the package foo, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Or all solver was like that, and now we are 10 times more. And Jazz also provides a complete tool chain inside the SUSE environment. I talked about SUSE environment. Uh, uh, SUSE is a distribution that has a lot of value, but a lot of the value of SUSE is also around the tooling we have for distribution. Uh, one example is the build service, which no other distribution has, um, which is basically self-service package building. We now have SUSE Studio, which is self-service distribution building. Um, and there are a lot of other tools. For example, if you want to build your own SUSE for your netbook and sell it, uh, you have the YAS first boot, which allows you to configure the system on the first boot. If you want to deploy SUSE in your university uh, in a really automatic way, you have all the auto YAS framework, where you can create a, a, a CD or some net, network booting uh, that will automatically install the distribution uh, or asking minimal questions. So what did we talk um, in the last year, and what did we did actually? In the 2009 challenge, we wanted to leverage a new base infrastructure because we introduced a lot of features. But from the moment you add new code or you have a new technology, something innovative, to the point that actually the users can uh, get this value, you have to, improve, to invest a lot in usability and user experience. That means we have a lot of features in the code that are there, but we don't know exactly how to bring them to the user, so how they are easy. And we want to improve also our support for community and distributions. One area where we did a lot of investment last year was in storage. We just came from redesigning the complete UI, from this uh, old, just partition your hard disk model, to now having RAID uh, LVM support, cryptography, and we wanted to build on top of this new UI. <coughs> so this is how the UI looks now. You can see uh, you have a, like a tree kind of view where you uh, you see the hard disk. You can configure right, right on top of this hard disk. You can also see the LVM volumes, uh, which files are encrypted. You have also NFS because you can install also over uh, two NFS uh, exports. Mm -hmm. And what kind of features we added um, <laughs> since 11.2? We have support, uh, experimental support, because actually the file system is not ready for battery FS. And this is a really cool technology. We added the support, as much support as we can. That means we can uh, create uh, in the partitions and format it with battery FS and so on. We'll start improving this as battery FS matures and get into the distributions. If you don't know what battery FS, the name butter comes actually from butter because it's a kind of, kind of flexible file system. You might have heard about ZFS from Solaris, which allows you to create uh, volumes and do copyright snapshots and so on. So ButterFS does the same for Linux. It's uh, developed by, by Oracle. Um, and it's quite cool. I think they have done a lot of innovative things and maybe a more clever implementation than the Solaris guy. So this will be coming and will be ready for it. Also, we mentioned later why a battery FS may be interesting uh, for you as an end user, but that's later in the challenge part. Um, also, in 11.2, you have the option to use X4. It's actually, I think, the default. Uh, and we will add, we added already in factory support. If you use factory, you already got this support in the UI for NFS v4. Um, then you have another two nice features. Um, if you use RAID, usually you create, you have a disk, you partition this disk, and then you have to take another disk and partition it in exactly the same way as the first one. And if you have a lot of disk or complex partition uh, schemes, this becomes really boring. So now we support disk cloning, which means you can take the complete partitioning and apply it to another disk. And if you don't like that, we also support in this new feature of Linux kernel 2.6, which is called partitionable array arrays. This means you can take a raw disk, make it a RAID array first, 
and then you can partition the rate array as a wall. So you don't need to partition the disk before you create the rate arrays. The advantages are here, it's much simpler. And the next feature we, uh, I think we work really hard for this one. Uh, it's a feature actually for, just for laptop that cost over $50,000. Do so you know which laptop is that one? It's not MacBook. Air? Yeah, I think that was a little bit cheaper. No one guessed? But actually the laptop that costs this money, according to Intel, is a laptop that is stolen. Because in average, uh, for companies, if you lose a laptop, the average of money lose from this is uh, about 50K. So the problem is today everyone has a laptop, and I think one every, one every six person will get the laptop stolen or lost. And if you have any data from much innocent it looks, uh, it's really a problem if it's just in the hard disk lying around. So there are a lot of there are a lot of solutions uh, uh, to these problems. Cryptography is one. I think this presumes a lot on how we treat cryptography today. Um, there is people that say cryptography is the solution. There's people because the second frame say this it's not. But if if you are hiding data from the government, maybe this comic is true, but if you are hiding your accounts or company information, cryptography is actually a pretty nice solution if it works out of the box. And with working out of the box, if you see the solutions you have right now in Linux, like encrypting your home directory, it doesn't really work because the system leaves traces of your data in other places like in the swap, in the memory, in temp files. So if you have just a part encrypted in your system, you are not guaranteed that you will leave traces other way, you know, in other places of the system. So the only solution is actually to encrypt the complete system as a wall. But if you encrypt the system as a wall, uh, it means, uh, what, how do I have a lot of partitions? Do I need to enter my password for every partition and so on? So we have now support for full disk encryption with a really nice scheme. And the best of this is that it's supported out of the box. If you just click in the UI, I want this kind of setup, I want to encrypt, you enter your password, and Yas will <coughs> build the boot partition um, and an encrypted partition using the uh, disk mapper on top of your hard disk, and on top of this encrypted partition, you will be that build an LVM system. So the swap, the root, and any partition you want is an LVM. And that means you just encrypt your volume once, and resume and suspend work out of the box. So if you resume for the hard disk, um, it will ask your password, and if not, you can just not see the content of the file system. Uh, it works really nice. Uh, I am running here in this laptop, and I can tell that uh, my encrypted system using X4 as a file system works much faster than my old file system, uh, my old 11.1 uh, open source using X3 without any encryption, and that's really nice. And another part where we invested uh, for 11.2 was the upgrade. There is a myth that Debian was the only distribution that could do an upgrade of the complete distribution and so on. And since 11.1, we support also this method. Do you know why your encrypted X4 is faster than your X3? I have no idea. Um, I suppose because X4 is faster. Because I was expecting, I mean, when I decided to create my world hard disk, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm willing to lose some performance because of the encryption. But at the end, the full, I'm talking about the complete system. I haven't done any measure only on the file system part. It may be also that the distribution as a whole is getting faster. Basically, what I'm telling you is that if you use OpenSUSE 11.2 with an encrypted setup, you won't, feel, you won't lose any performance compared to 11.1. Thanks. Um, and the upgrade, uh, what we wanted to support here was uh, going from one distribution release to the next one as a supported way. That means having a wiki page that explains the most typical problems you can encounter, but it should just work out of the box. Um, here you can see the most common use case, 11.1, 11.2. 
the boxes size are actually real life proportion proportions. How do you see the eleven two boxes? It looks like a box matches. Um, you can find in this wiki page all the instructions to do this upgrade. If you use factory, we don't support it officially, but you can. Uh, I mean, we don't have an instruction page with how to do it, but you can run just secret up with factory and keep your system up to date in the same way you will do with other distributions like Gentoo or Debian Unstable and so on. Just keep the latest all the time. Um, the, the, the algorithm we, we use for the for the system upgrade is also internal to the sub solver. It's a more aggressive upgrade. It will uninstall packages if needed and so on. The nice things about having a, a bleeding edge distribution in RPM is that RPM, uh, when we build the packages, we extract the dependencies of the libraries directly from the binaries. So it's not like in Debian where they, the packages say, I depend on the X11, I depend on this library. And then if the library changes the source version or something, uh, or the package does a mistake, you can have actually broken dependencies. But in, in our PM build service, we extract a lot of dependencies automatically and insert them into the RPM. And that makes that the, um, the dependencies much stronger. So it's really hard to get broken system. You can get a lot of dependency problems when trying to do the upgrade if you don't have a, a, all the needed packages to come again to a consistent state. The software will tell you you can't or you need to install this or you need to choose something. Uh, but it's not easy to get a broken system. Then how do you distinguish between build time dependencies and runtime dependencies if you're doing it automatically? What do you mean with runtime dependencies? Well, say you need a library to run your software, but you need something different to build it. Uh, if you're doing okay. all that stuff in the background, how do you no, no, distinguish? No, no, no. Um, what I mean is um, when, when you build a spec file for OpenSUSE, right. you don't expect, and you need to build against the lib curl. You, uh, the packager will uh, specify lib curl in the lib curl level in the mm -hmm. build requires. But he will not specify lib curl in the requires. He doesn't need to. Because if he, he doesn't do it in the build requires, he will not ever get the package to build. Because we built in a seed fruit environment. So only what's specified in the build requires gets there. Mm -hmm. But once it gets built, when it's finished building, there is some scripts uh, from the RPM build process that scan all the binaries and libraries we have and gets all the symbols. And the symbols are inserted as a, as a requires. And the library. Uh, so we don't require the name of the package of the library, you but the symbols. From the symbols. And then the library provides the symbols. Okay. And that makes really a strong dependencies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we also wanted to, this is something that's really in progress, but you know, in, in Factory and Element 2, you already have this tool called Wagon. Wagon in the sense of moving you from one distribution to the other one. Wagon is just a just front end to the uh, lip sync, uh, distribution upgrade algorithm. So it allows you to do the upgrade in a graphical way. And it offers you uh, the possible paths you have to upgrade your distribution and do, do a lot of uh, stuff like updating itself first to see if it's the latest running code. Um, and we want to bring this tool to make the compute work for the desktop so that you get notified when there's a new OpenSUSE release you click yes, I want to upgrade, and then you can just click next, next, until you are running the system. So this is our desktop upgrade uh, plan. Mm. We have all the product information in our, in our PM called full release, which is in this case OpenSUSE release package. The product information contains all the upgrade path, and so when OpenSUSE 11.1 is released, there is no upgrade path. But when we release 11.2, we just upgrade the release package. Uh, we, we, we release an update for the release package of 11.1 that says that you can jump to 11.2. Uh, package kit um, has a signal, a standard debug signal called district distribution upgrades available. It's not a signal, actually. It's a query, sorry. Um, package kit is integrated to libsyn using a special plugin. So we find this new upgrade path and we can notify to the desktop in a really standard way. That means that every, every package kit tool will get this signal and, and react. And when the user says, yes, I do want to upgrade and click yes, 
we run a distribution specific tool because package kit delegates this task to some script and in our case we launch Pagan. I think Fedora guys are doing it differently I mean they get information about the possible distributions from other places and then they start a tool called pre update pre upgrade or something they have another tool the nice thing is that for the end user they only see in package kit applications and that's nice when we started to support distribution upgrade we come of course uh, people started to use factory and they wanted to update every day and there was one just one package new they wanted to get it and then we started to find out all the problems like it takes ages to update um, one packet change and then everything was rebuilt and because RPM stores the timestamp in the RPMs you basically got uh, two gigabytes of new packages they were just exactly the same packages as before but because they were rebuilt by dependencies they got a different timestamp so they have different checksum and therefore they are new packages um, I think this problem uh, that was one problem, and the other one was, of course, uh, download bandwidth. Uh, I think one assumes that everyone is running DSL, fast DSL everywhere, but then you have those people that likes to upgrade the stuff when they are in, in the bus. I don't know why people do that, but they do, and there's people who are still using slow lines everywhere. And they complain that they don't get the best mirrors and so on. So for this, uh, we also uh, tackled this problem last year. This one we tackled it using ARIA as the download package instead of curl. The 11.2 is activated by default. ARIA is a download manager that has a really nice metalink support so it finds the best mirrors. And the nice thing is that it profiles the FTP sees and then it saves the results of its course. Uh, so next time you will always choose the mirrors that work best for you. And also, we're uh, using our mirror brain infrastructure that we have in nice redirectors. I think there was a talk about mirror brain also. I think it's next. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. Sorry, uh, Area 2, are you able to use that as a library or do you fork a special? We fork it. Yeah, okay. We fork it. And and everyone does. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, we, we, we are communicating all the time with, um, with, uh, Jack, uh, with, uh, with the author. Um, especially to add features, but not um, for 11.2 then. No, no. no. <laughs> and actually, we have to uh, we have to talk with him to agree on the protocol and the, yeah. and the command line options. It's tricky. But to be honest, I mean, I have best, best experience with all the tools we call from Lexip is a library, and we fork processes. Yeah. I have better results forking processes. Usually, the API is much more stable than trying to follow libraries. I mean, yeah. with curl, for example, we have kind of locking issues, threading, and so on. We don't have to worry about that here. So we also introduced since last year a lot of uh, features that were requested in our paid features of the uh, The most interesting one is uh, download control. Before, SUSE used to download one package, install it. Download one package, install it. Because we trust all the Lipsit dependency solver, so we install all their games with minus minus force. Because they're we already know exactly the transaction we want to do that is consistent. The problem is that uh, if you lost the network and you are in the middle of one transaction, you basically have a non-consistent system. So, but in installation, you actually do want to do that because you, you, don't, you don't want to use this space because you are running on RAM, for example. Um, so we introduced these four uh, options uh, to libsitconf. Uh, download only means now you can download the packages. This feature uh, was surprised me because a lot of people use actually libsyf to download the packages to do a transaction, then copy these packages to a USB stick and deploy them uh, somewhere else, like uh, to other servers. Something never I thought it was used, but it was really popular. Then we have download in advance, which uh, is the classical, uh, is in basically downloading the, all the packages and then starting the transaction. For that, you need, of course, hardware, but it's the most safe case. And in our package kit backend, the way we do the updating, we now use this option as a default because we don't want uh, people to get transactions interrupt in the middle when they are, they are out of battery or they are suspending and so on. Then we have downloading tips, which means we, this is not implemented yet, but we have the option there because this option 
is basically a subset, it's a more particular case of this one. In download in heaps, you download a bunch of RPMs that alone represent a consistent transaction. <coughs> and then you continue with the next ones. But we don't have it implemented, so it will just work as the other one. But this is still valid. We will implement it in, in the, for the next release. And download as needed is the classical behavior where we just need a package and we install it. And there we, the only thing download as needed do is that it tries to avoid CD hopping. So if you have two CDs and there are packages from one CD, we, we try to grab as many packages from one CD uh, before jumping to the other one to avoid people having to switch CDs. And of course, we implemented this in Zipper also. So you can alter the, uh, the behavior directly in the command line, overriding what is in the zip compile. You can use any of those four options or you can use download and pass the name of the mode you want to use. Also, there is some uh, download control built in. Uh, um, you can alter, for example, how many concurrent connections you have to avoid uh, floating servers. There is an uh, option to set the minimal download speed. This is for security reasons. I was also impressed about this report. There is a theoretical attack where an uh, attacker can uh, give you an update at so slow speed that it will take forever to cut this update and therefore will let, leave your system vulnerable for a long time. Okay, it's theoretical, but it's, you can now set a uh, minimal download speed before Lipsip actually drops the connection. And of course, you have the ARIA stats <coughs> in the catch of Lipsip, so if you want to alter the ranking yourself to treat mirrors in a different way, you can also do it. So we, we have two topics resolved. And I think the only one that is left is trying to use Delta RPMs for factory updates. But we are not yet, we haven't done research exactly how much that will help. I think the experience now, after uh, Kulo in factory implemented all these uh, build compares, that a package is not pushed to the factory mirrors, it is exactly the same build as before, only the timestamp change. We compare the binaries with really complex algorithm. Uh, and if they are, it's the same binary or equivalent, uh, then we don't push it. It's not a new package. That made the update scene factory much smaller. <clears throat> so this is something is pending, but we are not sure if we will actually put it as a priority. And this might be interesting for a lot of people. There was a lot of people complaining that we didn't have support for installing multi-version kernels. That means uh, having multiple version of kernels installed at the same time being added to update them. Now we have a switch in zipconf that allows you to specify any kind of uh, package you want to uh, keep in multi-versions. For the kernel it's a little bit more complicated, you have to put it as a provide. Uh, I don't want to go deep here in this talk about that, but that's mo mostly because of the dependency with uh, kernel modules, with drivers. Uh, but you can specify any package that can be installed in parallel in this line, and then you will get the UI to actually uh, show, uh, instead of a radio button, we show checkboxes. Mm -hmm. This was implemented for uh, SLES, but we will ship it as an update for 11.2 because it's a really popular request. Then we have uh, package notifications. Now you, uh, if you do an RPM yourself, you can drop a script, uh, a message to display to the user into this uh, directory called message steers. There is a standard uh, directory called var adm zip messages and you can configure now which program will actually display the message to the user. By default we send the mails to root and, but you can, you, you can change it to, to do whatever you want with the messages. So, um, what have we done to integrate Yast with the rest of the world? This is our vision right now. We want to integrate the system instead of using our recipe stuff. For that data center, we are trying to follow SIM. For the desktop, we are going with DBus. That means Yast is completely accessible now via DBus. Um, policy kit, package kit for system for software management. And for the appliances and all the world that SUSE Studio is bringing, um, we want to use the web. And why we want to use the web? 
um, basically because everyone speaks the web. I think everyone in this room knows HTTP, but probably nobody knows YCP. So that's why in the web apps we are doing for appliances, we are implementing everything using a REST interface. So you can configure your system just with XML and HTTP. In the last FOSDEM, I actually show a prototype of, um, uh, of WebEast with this interface. And by now, we are in a much better shape. Uh, this is how WebEast looks right now. You have updates. Uh, you can set things like time, services. Then you can see the status of your appliance uh, using the correct D, uh, statistic demon. Uh, you can see the health of your system. You can administer users. We haven't really focused uh, WebEast in OpenSUSE yet. It's available, will be available in the repositories. Um, but we wanted to offer it uh, something you can, if you use SUSE Studio to build your own appliance, like a firewall, a router, or so on, that you can use WebEast as a, to integrate and to provide the, the, the minimal configuration appliance needs. Uh, of course, in WebEast, we are, we are always requesting help. It's much easier to contribute than in normal YAS because it's Ruby on Rails, plus some integration with the system. Uh, so web designers, JavaScript, uh, wizards, and so on are welcome uh, in this project. The source code, I forgot to update these slides, is now in Vitorius Org OpenSUSE because we move all the code there. So I will now, what are the challenges and opportunities we have at YAS? First, we have to lower the barrier. I mean, we have a nice infrastructure, we have the build service, we have repositories, people can build their own packages, they can install their own software with one click, they can build their own distributions, but it's still uh, complicated. We, don't, we are not providing this experience yet. Everyone in, te in the telephones, in the Macs, in, the, in other things, they are used now to go to a portal, having applications, and just click and seeing what is the most popular stuff, and we are not providing this experience yet. We are far away from that. There is some OpenSUSE project, uh, some guys in the community doing a kind of software store, a uh, software portal. I think that's the first step of getting into experience where people can uh, kind of add the social part to installing software. Right now, uh, the build service still exposes a lot of complexity. If you try to understand how the KDE uh, or the Ruby uh, uh, repositories work together, what you have to have together to make things work and so on. This is still a long, long way to go. In 11.1 we introduced SIP services, which is a way of making a lot of repositories uh, act as a black box, so that you can say, subscribe me to this service, and, every, and this service has a list of repositories which can be dynamic. Um, this Technology is there since one distribution, and we don't yet expose it to the end user. This can be used to solve a lot of problems. We could create bundles of repositories like KDE. We could, uh, for example, uh, integrate Bugzilla. So if a guy is testing a, a bug, uh, he just refresh his services and get, get, he gets a special repository from the build service, which has an update for the bug he's testing. Uh, or you can just subscribe to the service of the most popular repositories. You refresh the service and then you get a completely different list next time. Or you could store your repository list, your favorites, in the build service and just subscribe to us uh, your uh, service in the build service. There's a lot of things that can be here, can be done here. Um, I guess the community can be much more involved. With respect with package history, we haven't done anything. So. This is something uh, we wanted to invest for the last uh, in the last FOSM, and we haven't actually. It's not even in the in the much priorities. Uh, the most top both features are round and download install in parallel, which is in our plan. We will probably will try to do it for 11.3, and show unneeded packages or a way to clean up your system of packages that are not needed is also in our radar. It's something we are researching on. This is the, what we are also investing for this for the next release, rollbacks, which means allowing people to go back um, to where they were before, after you apply updates and so on. This is a topic, um, every RPM has, uh, I think, tried rollback in the past. Conary has rollbacks. Everyone does it in a different way. Package Kit uh, API also has rollbacks. 
uh, but I think they remove it because they could not get it to work in a, as people expected to work. It's not a trivial problem anyway. So we are thinking about adding some kind of interface to Lexip, expose it in Yast, in Zipper. Uh, but we are not married yet with any strategy about how to do the rollbacks. So we will research doing them just with the package history, comparing what changed in the system. For example, if a package was installed because other packages depend on it, you, we know that this package actually was not the user who actually wanted to install this package. It was just needed. So we could remove this package. But a package that was selected directly by the user even if nobody depends on it, you, are, you cannot assume that you can just uh, wipe it. Maybe we can uh, research about dual system partitions like Google Chrome is to use, using. That means having two system partitions, hard disk is cheap. Every time you will install packages, you just update the status of the second partition to the first one. And if something fails, like your kernel doesn't boot, you just switch the partitions again. You have, a, again, a working system. And we also have better first options. That's why I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. It's interesting because it provides a really cheap way to do snapshot of the system and go back. Fedora, I think YAM is going with PathFS. Um, I'm not sure yet what's the best way because having implementing it with PathFS mean, means you need to have other FS file system. So we will see. But this is also in our top priorities. And that is so. Thank you very much. So, anyone has questions or? Yes? Uh, well, I would like to say, well, I have one advertisement and uh, one question. So the advertisement concerns, uh, there are two talks tomorrow about rollback, which are coming from our research project, the Makusi project, so you will see different aspects uh, of the office rollback question tomorrow. Um, the second thing concerns my, my real question. That uh, I would like to know a little bit more about how you're using the set solver to use uh, to resolve uh, dependency problems between packages. Because this is also something we have been doing in uh, in research projects since a long time. And uh, so to make it concrete, if you want to, uh, if you have a request to install something, there are a lot of different solutions that are possible, uh, and you could use different strategies to uh, uh, make a difference to, um, to find the best solution. Like you could ask for the installation of the least number of new packages, or a minimal installation size, or you could try to prefer certain packages and to give disadvantage to other packages, or to remove the least number of packages, things of that nature. Uh, do you have a fixed strategy that you employ in order to find the best solution, or do you have a notion the yes and no. Uh, the SAP Solver API has hooks called policies where you can uh, you can score the, poly the different solutions as you want. For for our package management system, we do have fixed policies uh, um, like uh, architect changing architecture, for example, is something we don't want to do. Changing the architecture of a package. Uh, if there is a solution that means changing the architecture of a package. What do you mean by the changing the architecture? Like switching from 64-bit uh, to 32-bit. Okay. Um, if we do super upgrade, not the this upgrade, but upgrade, we don't want solutions that implies uh, removing packages. So all these things are policies, and the SAT solver includes a lot of policies you can use. Mm -hmm. But if you use the SAT solver as a library, you can always plug the code, so you can plug your own policies there and implement different strategies. But the default works for you what you spec I think. Mm -hmm. I mean what OpenSUSE gives is experience right now. But we have a police API, yes. Policy API, sorry. Uh, with respect with the talks, yes, I saw the talks in the I actually wanted to go to that talks only, uh, mainly, uh, the rollbacks ones. Um, but my flight is at three PM tomorrow and I think all the interesting talks are later. <laughs> so uh, I think the first talk by, by, by John is tomorrow morning at uh, because okay. it has been, it has been there, but yes. I think Jeff's talk is, uh, is, uh, is, is later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. If you want then to discuss more about this hard solver, so we can so okay. run it later. Hmm? Okay. Any other question? Okay, then thank you again. Thank you very much.